Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Engelbard Gaming. Lately I've been covering a lot of Sega ports on various different home computers and consoles, and I figured why not continue that trend. So today I'll be taking a look at Sega ports for the Fujitsu FM Towns computer that was only released in Japan. What's an FM Towns exactly? Well, this! You may not realize it, but Fujitsu released several computers in Japan. Among them was the FM Towns that you're looking at right now. There's also a console version of the FM Towns called the FM Towns Marty that you might be familiar with. I'm not going to delve into the differences between the Towns and the Marty in any detail, just to understand that even though they used pretty much the same hardware, the Marty was not 100% compatible with FM Towns games even though many of them worked. Most games for the FM Towns were delivered on CD-ROMs, but there were also many on floppy disks. The FM Towns was a pretty advanced PC when it was released in 1989. The original FM Towns ran on a 16 MHz 386 SX CPU. It could display graphics in a variety of resolutions with various color counts, ranging from 16 colors simultaneously all the way up to 32,768, depending on the graphics mode. It could also throw a whole bunch of sprites around on screen. 1,024 of them to be precise, but they all had to be 16 by 16 each with a limit of 16 colors per sprite. There were several different models of the FM Towns released in Japan over the course of its lifetime, including some that actually even used Pentium processors running at up to 120 MHz. Regarding sound on the system, many of its CD-based games used Redbook audio as you might expect. The system was also equipped with an FM sound chip, the same YM2612 found in the Mega Drive slash Genesis, along with a more advanced 8-voice PCM chip, the Rico RF5C68, which was also used in Sega's System 18 and System 32 arcade boards. When the FM Towns was released, it was a little pricey, roughly the equivalent of $3,000, so right about the same price as the Sharp X68000. And, well, that's the tech of the FM Towns in a nutshell. Yeah, so that sounds pretty impressive, huh? Those Sega ports must really be something on the FM Towns. Well... First off, there's only a handful of them available. There were a total of seven Sega or Sega-related games released for the system. These included Afterburner 2, Afterburner 3, Columns, Galaxy Force, Last Survivor, Puyo Puyo, and Turbo Outrun. You'll notice many of these games are ports from Sega Superscalar games in the arcade, which were notoriously powerful and hard to translate to home systems back in the day. So could the FM Towns with its 32-bit power reproduce these games faithfully? Why don't I stop yammering and we'll all take a look right now. Alright, let's get on with it. Here's Afterburner 2. If there was one game that you could really use to show off powerful new hardware, this was it. The arcade original ran on Sega's very powerful X-Board, and it was really impressive at launch. Afterburner 2 just had loads of stuff going on visually, including a fully rotating horizon, smooth scaling of sprites both in the sky and on the ground, super fast gameplay, and a fantastic soundtrack. How did Afterburner 2 fare on the FM Towns computer? I have to say, we're not exactly off to the best start here. This game is a lot choppier than the versions on vastly inferior hardware like the PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16 and the Genesis slash Mega Drive. On the plus side, the FM Towns game throws a lot more around on screen, particularly on the ground, than those versions. But even so, FM Towns Afterburner 2 just doesn't play nearly as well as the other home ports on those consoles. In terms of gameplay, this is a real mess on FMT. The plain auto centers, which I'd say is a giant no-no when you're using a digital control pad. The auto centering makes locking onto enemies with missiles almost impossible. You've basically got to tap the D-pad like a madman to have any hope of hitting just the right angle to lock onto distant enemies. On the plus side, at least this version of Afterburner 2 does include speed controls. Now the music is Redbook Audio here, and it's pretty great. Some of the songs are downright amazing in this version. I don't prefer every single one here to the arcade original, 
but it's still great overall, and I appreciate this soundtrack. In the end, FM Town's Afterburner 2 is very... meh. The choppy frame rate kind of ruins the visual appeal, and the big chunky things on the ground just don't quite look right. It's kind of impressive in screenshots, but as a game, I have to say it just isn't a very good version of Afterburner 2. Now don't get me wrong, it blows away the garbage Western computer ports, but this is the fourth or fifth best port of Afterburner 2 at best. Next on the agenda here is Afterburner 3. There's no arcade version, so we're going to look at something very close. g -Luck. Now, don't give me flack about this one. I know the games aren't identical, but they're definitely cut from the same cloth and have a lot of the same features and play mechanics. I know they're not the exact same game. The way you progress through levels in particular is different in each. If you feel the need to ring me out in the comments, then hey, go ahead, knock yourself out. Anyway, here we are. G-Lock was released on Sega's arcade Y-Board in 1990, the same hardware that ran games like Power Drift and Galaxy Force 2. When this arcade board came out, it was one of the most powerful pieces of arcade hardware ever launched. The Y-Board could show up to 2,048 sprites on two separate sprite planes, could scale and rotate those sprites, and even entire background layers, and could do other visual tricks that were far beyond the home hardware of the era. So how did the 32-bit FM Towns do with its equivalent game that came out in 1992? The answer is... Not well. FMT Afterburner 3 is an incredibly bland-looking game that seems like it's running on much less capable hardware. The ground is pretty barren except for some dots. It doesn't have the textures of the arcade version, which even the Genesis port managed to simulate, and it's really just very basic. The only real positives here are the nice cockpit transition effects, and the fact that it puts a decent amount of enemies on screen. On the gameplay front, Afterburner 3 is dull as dishwater and super easy. I beat it on my very first try. Unlike its predecessor, it's slow and boring. In fact, neither Arcade G-Lock nor Afterburner 3 on the FM Towns are fun to play, and as follow-ups to Afterburner 2, they're both giant steps backwards in pretty much every way. FM Towns Afterburner 3 is definitely the worst of the two games, though, since it isn't even visually interesting. Also, the music is as bland and forgettable as the graphics, leading to an experience that no one should feel bad about missing. One last side note for this game, the same developer, CRI, released a port of Afterburner 3 for the Sega CD that I'd say is better than the FM Towns version in every way while still not being all that good. They added ground details to that one, you can have your view behind the plane at all times, and it incorporates the CD music from the FM Towns version of Afterburner 2. So it's better, but it's still not good. In the end, Afterburner 3 is definitely not a shining moment in FM Towns gaming. It looks dramatically worse than the game it's mostly based on, and it just isn't fun to play. Here's Columns. I've shown you the arcade, Genesis, PC Engine, and X68000 versions so far. The X68000 version looked like garbage and wasn't technically based on the arcade game. Arcade columns ran on what was essentially Genesis slash Mega Drive hardware, so the Genesis game was basically identical to the arcade one. The PC Engine version was a good port of the arcade and Genesis games from Telenet, and Telenet did the FM Towns version of columns as well. And as you'd probably expect, it's pretty much perfect. Interestingly, this is the only Sega game on the FM Towns that was on a floppy disk instead of a CD-ROM. As you'd imagine, it doesn't take a ton of space to reproduce columns. The Genesis version was on a 1 megabit or 128 kilobyte cartridge after all. There's not a ton to look at here, so I'll make coverage of this one quick. FM Towns Columns is a great port and worth playing. Did you need an FM Towns to play Columns? Definitely not. But if you already had one, Hey, you could at least get a version that looked and sounded very good and played completely fine. I can't imagine anyone with an FM Towns would not have been happy with this version of the game. So hey, FM Towns fans, here's one you can lord over those smarmy X68000 fans that you just can't stand. Anyway, let's move on. This is Galaxy Force 2. The original 1988 arcade version of Galaxy Force 2 
ran on Sega's Y board, which I told you about in the G Lock slash Afterburner 3 section just a little bit ago. Galaxy Force 2 had some of the most impressive 3D effects I'd ever seen prior to the release of polygon crunching hardware several years later. It's really pretty staggering. And on an unrelated note, check out the 3DS version of this game if you never have. It's one of the most impressive uses of 3D on the entire system. Anyway, as you can see, Arcade Galaxy Force 2 still looks pretty amazing even today. How did the FM Towns handle Galaxy Force 2 when it was released in 1991? In this case, not too badly. I'd say this is probably the most impressive of the Sega Super Scalar ports that made their way to the FM Towns. No, it's not exactly super close to the arcade game or anything like that, but until the Saturn version came along, this would have been hands down the best port of Galaxy Force 2 that you could play at home. Does that mean it was good? Well, not necessarily, but in this case, yeah, it's pretty good. The scaling employed by this game is fine, despite the relatively low frame rate that's nowhere near the buttery smooth 60 frames per second of the arcade original. A lot of the impressive arcade effects are actually translated pretty well in this version, including heading into the tunnels in which you have to navigate enclosed areas with sharp turns. Well, more like slides than turns, but still. We also get the cool looking fire snakes in the second area, the big spreading enemies of the water world, and stuff like that. I mean, if you look at versions of Galaxy Force 2 that were around on other home hardware at the time, this one is head and shoulders above those. On the FM Towns, the music is once again Red Book Audio, and it sounds really nice, if not exactly awe-inspiring. The gameplay is reasonably good, but it just doesn't quite feel the same as the arcade version. The controls aren't quite as smooth, and the way you navigate the environments isn't quite the same. As admirable a job as CRI did with this home port, they still just couldn't squeeze all the graphics and mechanics from the arcade version into this one. But hey, A for effort. This is Last Survivor. It's a weird arcade game from Sega that they released in 1989 on their X board, the same one that powered Afterburner 2. The arcade version employed a rotating joystick to help you navigate a 3D maze while you killed respawning monsters and other human enemies. Killing human opponents in-game will get you keys that you need to unlock the exit and go on to the next level. It's sort of like a mashup of Faceball 2000 and Gauntlet. I'll straight up admit that I am not a fan of this game. It's not terrible, but there's pretty much nothing compelling about it. If you're playing against a friend, you at least have that competitive aspect and it can lead to a few laughs, but that's about the extent of it. I guess on the positive side of things, I can say it looks pretty nice for the time it came out. Now, Last Survivor came to the FM Towns in 1990, and, well, here it is. Once again, we've got a pretty decent port of the arcade game. The graphics are cut back significantly from the original, which becomes especially apparent in some levels a little further into the game. But overall, it looks and plays okay, and I kind of prefer the controls on the FM Towns version to the arcade original. In the FM Towns version, you use the D-pad to move around freely, and then there's a camera rotation button that you hold and use the D-pad to rotate the camera. The other button is your fire button. Oh, and just to avoid any confusion, in the arcade version, I'm the player on the right, and in the FM Towns version, I'm the player on the left. Once again, we get a pretty nice soundtrack to go along with the game. The gameplay, such as it is, is close enough to the arcade version that I imagine it would have satisfied fans back in the day. Today, though, I wouldn't really recommend playing this game either in its original arcade form or the FM Towns port. It's really just not that much fun. In the end, Last Survivor on FM Towns is a significantly scaled back port of a technically superior arcade game that manages to still translate the experience to a home computer of the era pretty well. It's an interesting curiosity of a game that I'd bet most Sega fans haven't even ever heard of, but it's the kind of game you'll play once or twice and then probably never want to come back to again. Alrighty, here's 1992's arcade Puyo Puyo running on the C2 board that's essentially a Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive. As a reminder, this was originally by Compile, but Sega owns the franchise now, which is why I include it in these videos. To recap prior versions I looked at, the Genesis version is basically perfect since the hardware is pretty much identical. The PC Engine CD version used the format for voices instead of Red Book Music, and that was a big mistake in my opinion. The X68000 had a weird flicker problem. Can the FM Towns give us a decent version of Puyo Puyo? The answer to that is... mostly. This 1994 FM Towns port of Puyo Puyo is... Eh, it's fine. 
It doesn't have the parallax scrolling in the stage intros from the arcade and Genesis versions of the game, and the frame rate is significantly lower. But in this case, it doesn't really hamper the experience. Overall, I would still place this version of the game behind the arcade, Genesis, and possibly even the PC Engine CD versions of Puyo Puyo. Uh, but it does beat the x68000 version, since it doesn't have that glitchy flicker present in that game. Puyo Puyo is a little more complicated than Columns, and CD-ROM was the sexy format of the time, so it isn't surprising that this version of the game came on CD. We've got a soundtrack here that can be equal parts good and infuriated. You've just gotta hear it. Presentation-wise, aside from the lower frame rate and the cut parallax, everything you'd expect from the original Puyo Puyo release is present and accounted for. FM Town's Puyo Puyo falls into the category of games that I'll define as good enough. I've said it before and I'll say it again now. You wouldn't buy a $3,000 computer to play this version of the game, but if you've already had the FM Towns and wanted to play it, well, yeah, okay, this was alright. But if you also had a Genesis or Mega Drive, well, Puyo Puyo for that system is still superior to this one. Alright, and that brings us to our final game of the episode, Turbo Outrun. Sega's Turbo Outrun hit arcades in 1989, and essentially was to Outrun what Super Hang-On was to Hang-On. It is a mildly upgraded version of the original's gameplay mechanics, with a high-speed Turbo Boost gimmick. The difference is that Super Hang-On was notably better than the original game, while Turbo Outrun, well, isn't. It's a so-so racer, it just doesn't deliver the same feel of the original, and the new stuff, namely the Turbo Boost and in-between area part upgrades, just isn't all that interesting. There are no branching paths this time around either. What we do have are slightly improved graphics, less interesting soundtrack, and pretty good gameplay that doesn't quite measure up to the original. And on the FM Towns, Turbo Outrun is another pretty good port. At least we get to end on a positive note here, right? FM Towns Turbo Outrun also came out in 1989, and is probably the best port of the game on a contemporary home system. Like every game in this video, the scaling and frame rate aren't as smooth as the original arcade game, and there isn't quite as much going on in terms of roadside objects, clouds, and things like that. But while it's definitely a bit stripped down, it's also pretty much the only home version I've ever tried that's actually worth playing. The CD audio soundtrack definitely sounds nicer than the arcade original release. The handling is acceptable. It's not great, but it's good enough to keep the game from getting too frustrating. The difficulty is also high enough to keep you coming back without being overbearing or making you feel like you'll never make any progress. And really, any flaws in the gameplay here are inherited from the arcade original. So when all is said and done, Turbo Outrun is another pretty solid port for the FM Towns. This is one case where the original game wasn't so hot, so neither it nor this port are what I would exactly call must-play driving experiences. FMT Turbo Outrun showed what the computer was capable of early in its life at least, and that was having a pseudo-3D racer with more going on visually than most competing hardware of the time could manage. So, Turbo Outrun devs at CRI, you did pretty well with this one, even though you didn't have the best game to work with. Alright, so, believe it or not, that's it. Those were all the Sega or Sega-related games that appeared on the Fujitsu FM Towns platform. So, what kind of conclusions can we draw based on these Sega games? First, I've got to say that for these Super Scalar games, none of them were even really close to perfect. But it would be another generation, it wouldn't be until the Saturn, that we would see perfect ports of some of those games. And some of them, like Galaxy Force 2 or Power Drift on the Saturn, were still running at lower frame rates than the arcade games. It would be an additional generation beyond that before we saw what I would truly deem perfect ports of those games. And what about the 2D games? Well, even with simple things like Columns and Puyo Puyo, you could see that they were a lot choppier than even the cheap 16-bit Genesis Mega Drive versions that would have been available at the same time. So as a platform to play Sega ports, it's hard to recommend the FM Towns. So you might be wondering at this point, who was the FM Towns really for? And truly, it was marketed at two very specific segments. The first was education, and then the second was luxury. So because of that, you would typically either find them in schools, or among households that had plenty of disposable income. Because of that, it did at least end up with a decent-sized library of games, and there are a few good ones on here, there's no question about that. 
The real thing you have to wonder about here is was this computer worth the $3,000 asking price in 1989 and beyond? And looking at what you got for that, which was a system that played some decent and in some cases more advanced versions of these games than were available on other platforms, they still often fell very short of the arcade versions that they were based on that in some cases cost less than this computer did. Now overall, the FM Towns was still kind of successful thanks to the way that it was marketed, and the line sold about 500,000 units in Japan. Now later on, Fujitsu released the console versions, which were the FM Towns Marty and the FM Towns Marty 2. Now these were cost-reduced versions of the FM Towns that had a lot of the same inner components and ran many of the same games, but were not 100% compatible. The FM Towns Marty sold for about a little over 700 at the point that it came out, so it was a lot less of the computer, but it was still a lot more than most of the game systems available at the time that it was released. And while I just let you know that the FM Towns computer line was a success, selling about 500,000 units, the Marty line of consoles was markedly less successful, selling only about one-tenth of that, or less than 50,000, if the numbers online are to be believed, and judging by the rarity of the thing, I tend to think they are. So these days, I would say the FM Towns line, including the computers and the Martys, is an interesting curiosity to take a look at and see what was going on in the upper end of the Japanese market that you would have missed back in the late 80s and early 90s. If you want to check out an early visual computer operating system from Japan, well, you can do that and see Towns OS in action. You would need to know Japanese or at least be willing to look up translations in order to navigate around it, but it's an interesting thing to take a look at. And for the more adventurous among you, if you're willing to deal with a lot of Japanese and fooling around with settings that are unfamiliar, you can even install early versions of Windows on some of these things. So I'll close this video out with a little fun fact. And it's kind of Mandela effecty as an added bonus. Gamers of a certain age who grew up in the US reading magazines like EGM, or Electronic Gaming Monthly, might think that there was a port of R-Type to the FM Towns that was just about perfect. EGM showed it in one of their issues, and even said, hey, every system needs a good version of R-Type to show how powerful it is. I have that issue, I remember reading it back in the day. But here's the fun part. There was no official commercial version of R-Type ever released for the FM Towns or the FM Towns Marty. That's right, the game never came out. Don't believe me? Well, go hit up Google on your own, my friends. I think you'll be surprised at what you find, or more to the point, what you don't. So tell me, did you have an FM Towns back in the day, or do you have one now? What about an FM Towns Marty, a Marty 2, or a Car Marty? Tell me all about your experiences with the computer. I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Is this your first time seeing it? I'd love to hear your impressions on that as well. And that will bring this video to a close, my retro gaming friends. If you enjoyed it, please toss it a like and share it online somewhere. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell. If you don't hit the bell, there's a good chance YouTube will not let you know when I release a new video these days. If you enjoy what you see here and you want to support my work, you can do that on Patreon or Ko-fi. The links appear at the end of the video and also down below in the description. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.